Today we are finally in Moscow, one of the pinnacles of the Napoleonic Wars. My the gosh, is finally really? Under what in the world? They have a lot of women's clothing. No way. Oh my god, oh my god. I Hello everybody. Roger says hey. So I'm really excited. We finally made it to Moscow. This is one of the videos that a lot of you have been waiting for other than Waterloo. We actually only have five videos left in this series, four until we get to Waterloo. So we are kind of getting on the home stretch here. I think home stretch is a baseball term. So if a lot of you are watching from Europe, you probably don't know what that means, or maybe you do just because it's, it's a phrase that's really famous, I feel like. But just some really quick housekeeping before we get into this. I do have some social media. If you want to go check that out and follow me, there. I just give you some behind the scenes looks at this channel. But now we're going to get into comment time, which is one of my favorite times of these videos. And I'm going to take a look at some of your comments from the previous video that we did in this series. If you want to skip this and go right to the reaction right now, you click the reaction chapter in this video and go straight there. But for now, let's just take a very quick look at a handful of your comments. So the first comment we have is from Andrew Shaw, and he says that the fire in Moscow will be explained in the next video. The choice of phrases because the event is rather famous. There have been a lot of really famous events that have happened in these the Napoleonic Wars that I'm really unaware of because we just don't really study them over here in the United States. But it's been really fun getting introduced to them. At the end of the last video, there was fire set in Moscow and I kind of asked, well, why is that? Is that part of the scorched earth thing? And a lot of you guys let me know, yes, they would rather burn Moscow than allow Napoleon to occupy it. So I guess we're going to find out in this video more about that. They also were showing a lot of redoubts and a lot of constructions around the guns in this last video. And I had to ask you guys, well, what the heck is a redoubt? To me, it looks like just, it looked like they some piled up some earth, you know, kind of around the cannons to kind of maybe fortress them a little bit. A lot of you guys had comments on that one, but Josh Thomas Moore says that a redoubt is an earthwork. I'm assuming an earthwork just means you use materials from the earth to fortify something. I'm not even sure what an earthwork is. Um, that covers the side and the front of the guns and sometimes has a trench in the front as well. He says that something that wasn't mentioned is that the readout is meant to be open in the back so the gunners can pull the cannons out quickly if they need to. Well, I kind of assume that because I only saw like a horseshoe shape with the earthworks or the uh, readouts. So I assumed that the back was open. When I get into watching like Sharp and Waterloo, I'm assuming and we'll probably see some of these in action. So I'll get a better sense of what they look like. One of the biggest things in the last video was just the sheer number of casualties. I think it was close to 80,000 in total at Borodino and I was having a hard time kind of like seeing that in my head what that might look like on the battlefield and kind of what that was like in comparison to other wars. A lot of you let me know that World War One is like way worse apparently which we'll probably get to in the not too distant future but Kurt Septon said to grasp the scale of Borodino one commenter put it as follows imagine a jumble jet full of people crashing in these fields every three minutes from breakfast until sundown. <laughs> Wow, that is a lot of people. And you say that these these jets would hold over 400 people on the battlefield is 11 square miles. I have a hard time picturing what 11 square miles actually is. But yeah, that that is a ton of people. And a lot of you also reminded me the casualty doesn't mean dead necessarily. They could just be injured. And I was also wondering, well, what the heck do they do with all of these people? Well, also a lot of you let me know that they just kind of left them there in the field. Like there wasn't much they could do. They would maybe lay there for days waiting for medical attention, or maybe they, they might die from their injuries waiting for medical attention. Yeah, it just did not seem like a good situation. I mean, man, war is brutal now these days, but back then it was like, I don't know, it just feels like it's it was way worse. There's also a picture in the last video of some cavalry that were kind of spread out, and I understand that that was an artist rendering, but I figured that there might be some truth also in the way that that looked. And D.V. Vincentius, I'm assuming that's how you say that instead of Vincentius, because that looks Latin and the C's have a hark sound in Latin. So, oh, by the way, I know Latin isn't a spoken language, but that is kind of the way the scholars have agreed to pronounce it nowadays. So that's what I'm doing. He says that the loose formation used by the cavalry was often used to avoid cannon fire on approaching the enemy. And then they closed in to charge as soon as they were near the enemy formations. So yeah, I guess there was a tactic there. And also below his comment, there was somebody else who commented that the doctrine of the time required in combat formation to have the horses uh, width apart from each other so that that gave the rider 
Peter's room for mobility, dodging rocks, hedges, and that sort of thing. So yeah, I guess that makes sense. There are going to be things on the battlefield that you're going to have to kind of go around, and if you're in that tight formation, it doesn't give you any leeway to do that. So that did answer most of my questions that I had in the last video, and of course there were way more comments than that, and I did read through them, so thank you all for leaving them for me. We're going to go ahead and jump into this next video. It's a longer one. It's about 27 minutes long, which I guess makes sense. This is going to be one of the more famous battles or times during the Napoleonic Wars, so they're probably going to spend a little bit more time on it, which is totally fine. I'm, all, I'm always down for that. Let's see how Napoleon handles this, because I know that he does end up retreating. Obviously, it's in the title of this, so... And I've known for the weeks and months leading up to this that he did eventually retreat from Moscow anyway, so obviously this is not going to go well for him, but again, I don't know how it plays out. Like, I don't know what happens, what leads to his retreat, how the Russians are able to take Moscow back and so forth. So let's take a look. Peace slows in Moscow. So did that mean that he thought that if he took Moscow that Russia would basically just give in and surrender and peace would be declared between the two? Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. This is kind of the same intro he had in his last video. <laughs> the 15th of September, 1812. 83 days after invading Russia, a week after his costly victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered Moscow. He expected to be greeted by dignitaries, formally offering the city's surrender. Wow, really? Instead, he discovered that 90% of Moscow's inhabitants had fled. A fire had started the previous night and was blamed on drunken soldiers. But over the next 48 hours, fires continued to break out across Moscow yeah. until most of the city was ablaze. Count Fyodor Rostopchin, the city's governor, had ordered that Moscow be destroyed rather than allowed to fall into enemy hands. Okay. I was about to ask, who was the, who were the people uh, starting the fires? Were they civilians or were they uh, soldiers? But maybe, maybe it was both. Uh, but if he gave the actual order for Moscow to be destroyed, I'm assuming that those are Russian soldiers that are probably doing that. Did they order an evacuation of Moscow? Though I, I'm assuming they would have had to. Let's see if they say. And now fires were being started deliberately by Russian criminals freed from oh. jail and acting on police orders. French soldiers rounded up and shot any they could catch. But the inferno was impossible to contain. Well, just imagine what it have been like in the streets of that In four time. days, two thirds of Moscow was destroyed. Oh my With gosh, the fires finally really? under control, Napoleon's soldiers turned their attention to systematically looting the ruined city. Okay, so in that case, is Moscow a fairly, like, recently rebuilt city? Because I kind of had this idea that, you know, it had been around for centuries or millennia. I'm not sure kind of when Moscow was founded, but I kind of had in my head that, you know, the buildings and the architecture kind of went way back. If that's the case, then it would have been rebuilt quite a bit, I would imagine, in the 19th century. Maybe? Hmm. While from his new quarters in the Kremlin, Napoleon sent a letter to Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg, inviting With him to make peace and end the war. He received no reply. Napoleon waited, confident that Alexander would eventually negotiate. But as the days passed, he grew increasingly uneasy. 
So Contact. this seems like uh, very egotistical of Napoleon to me, that he's just assuming that the Russians are going to surrender. Why exactly? They've given no indication that that would be the case, so I don't, I don't really understand his mindset here. You guys can kind of explain that to me. I'd appreciate it. Cossack raids were disrupting his vital communications with Paris, as well as the arrival of supplies. While the steady attrition of French forces and Russian reinforcements meant Napoleon was outnumbered for the first time in the campaign. Mm. Rumours also reached okay. him that his reluctant allies, Prussia and Austria, were in secret talks with his enemies. Napoleon had proposed that the army winter in Moscow, but that now looked too dangerous. Reluctantly, he accepted that the army would have to move back to Smolensk to find safe winter quarters. Napoleon knew how severe Russian winters could be, but continued to put off his departure, reassured by fine October weather, and hoping that at the last minute there might be a message from Alexander offering peace. He seems to be just assuming a lot of things right here that it won't necessarily come to be. Assuming that the winter is going to hold off, apparently. Assuming that Russia is going to want to offer peace. Again, why? Also, why did he think it was too dangerous in Moscow? Was there just going to be too much opposition from the people there, from the soldiers, um, to in order to feel safe staying in Moscow? Because that's got to be quite a blow. You take Moscow, which I know was not the capital of Russia, right? St. Petersburg was the capital at this point in Russia. So it's not as like maybe important as it would be today if you took Moscow. But still, like it's a, it's a major city in Russia. So I'd imagine that, you know, you go and you take that and then you have to leave it. It's kind of demoralizing. The last minute, there might be a message from Alexander offering peace. It never came. On the 13th of October, the first light snow fell. Five days later, Kutuzov launched a surprise attack on Murad's advance guard at Vinkova and defeated it. Napoleon, stung into action, gave the order for the army to leave Moscow the next day. Now is the moment my campaign begins. Oh, Russia. I thought Napoleon said that. I was like, okay, you're really egotistical. 100,000 men of the Grande Armée left Moscow in a column 10 miles long, with an estimated 40,000 carriages and carts. Yeah, that's a big target. There were women and children too. Army wives and the vivandières, the women who cooked for the soldiers, as well as some civilians. Every wagon and pack was stuffed with as much food and loot as possible. As he set off, Sergeant Bourgogne of the Imperial Guard made an inventory of his pack. It contained several pounds of sugar, some rice, some biscuit, half a bottle of liqueur, a woman's Chinese silk dress embroidered in gold and silver, several gold and silver ornaments, amongst them a piece of the cross of Ivan the Great. Besides these, I had my uniform, a woman's large riding cloak, two silver pictures in relief, 12 inches long and eight high, all in the finest workmanship. Also several lockets and a Russian prince's spittoon set with precious stones. I wore over my shirt a yellow silk waistcoat, which I had made myself out of a woman's skirt. Over that, a large cape lined with ermine and a large pouch hung at my side by a silver cord. This was full of various things, amongst them a crucifix in gold and silver and a little Chinese porcelain vase. Then there were my firearms, powder flask and 60 cartridges in the box. Um, they have a lot of women's clothing, apparently. Does this, is this just like clothes that they tore off of women in Moscow? <laughs> also, I get the looting, like I understand you want to take back treasures for yourself from, you know, these foreign lands or whatever, but my goodness, you are really making yourself way more vulnerable doing that. Can't be a very effective army if you're hauling all of that junk around. Well, not junk, but you know, junk 
in comparison to, you know, like, the more necessary military items, you know, to keep yourself from getting killed, basically. I know looting and stuff still goes on today in militaries. I don't think nearly as much. Like, I know soldiers today already carry, like, 100 pounds or maybe more worth of gear around just military stuff, like the necessities. Never mind picture frames and stuff. Like, what in the world? I also didn't know that, uh... They had a bunch of women going along with them to cook for them and so forth. This is the very first time I think he's mentioned it in this series, so I had no idea that all of that was going on. This heavily encumbered army did not yet realize it was in a race against time. The Russians were beginning to move against the flanks of Napoleon's 550 mile deep salient. That very day, Wittgenstein's army was driving back Marshal Saint-Cyr's outnumbered force at Polatsk, and drawing Victor's IX Corps west to support them. In the south, Admiral Chichagov's advance had Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps falling back to cover Warsaw. See, the Russians are starting to outnumber the uh, Napoleon's side here, and I know he's got some other um, troops from other countries fighting along with him, so I didn't want to just say the French. But uh, yeah, I, I think I said a few videos back that I expected the Russians to eventually outnumber Napoleon's troops, and so we're starting to see it here, although it's not like a huge uh, number that, that uh, he has over Napoleon, but I was just kind of gauging that again off of um, what I've seen or heard about the Russians and other more modern wars where they eventually, the way that they overcome their enemies just by sheer numbers, like outnumbering them. So I kind of expected the same thing to happen here. The corridor was closing. And then there was the weather. Though Napoleon was confident his army could reach winter quarters in Smolensk in 20 days, well before the more extreme temperatures were due to hit. So is he Napoleon taking that plan? indirect route because there are enemy in Vyazma? I'm just assuming he doesn't want to uh, go through there because he's going to run into Russian troops. Temperatures were due to hit. Napoleon planned to withdraw via Kaluga, through unspoilt country where the army could forage for supplies. Oh, that explains it. Sorry. But Kutuzov sent General Dokturov's Sixth Corps to block the road at Malo Yaroslavets. In fierce fighting, Italian troops of Eugène's 4th Corps drove the Russians out of the town. It was a hard-won victory, reminiscent of the fighting at Borodino. Kutuzov now stood oh between Napoleon and Kaluga. Look at that. Okay, Battle of Malo Yaroslavets. <laughs> That is a long name. Kutuzov now stood between Napoleon and Kaluga. Napoleon now took the unusual step of conferring with his marshals. And after discussing various options, he decided that rather than seek another major battle, they would retreat the way they'd come, along the Smolensk road. Napoleon had okay. hoped to avoid this route, as it meant marching back through country already stripped bare of supplies. Okay, so it was a supply The thing. day after the fighting at Malo Yaroslavets, hey, Napoleon birthday. was nearly captured by a group of Cossacks, and saved only by General Rapp's charge at the head of his escort. After this close shave, Napoleon had a file of poison made up, which he carried around his neck in case of capture. No way. Those who were too weak to carry their weapons or knapsacks threw them away, and all looked like a crowd of gypsies. Napoleon's army set off on its new course, shadowed at a respectful distance by Kutuzov's army to the south. They passed the old battlefield of Borodino, a grisly, unnerving sight, where crows pecked at half-buried corpses. Okay, so how long has it been since Borodino at this point? I don't remember the exact dates. 
It's probably been at least a month though, right? Which I can't imagine, like... By then, if you had just been injured and you were laying there, you're probably dead by this point, obviously. Relentless marching quickly began to tire out men and horses. A few days later, the temperature fell below freezing. The army's overworked, starving horses died en masse. Discipline began to break down, as some drivers simply dumped the sick and wounded by the roadside to try to ensure their own survival. As the French column became increasingly strung out, General Miloradovich, commanding Kutuzov's advance guard, fell on Davout's rear guard outside Vyazma. For a few hours, Davout's first corps was cut off, until Eugène and Ney came to his rescue. The battle ended with street fighting in Vyazma, as the French hastily evacuated the burning town. For the soldiers of the Grande Armée, so unaccustomed to retreats and routs, Vyazma was an alarming, demoralising blow. Yeah, that's kind of what I said a few minutes ago. The road was strewed with the dead, our suffering succeeded in our generation. On the 4th of November, it began to snow heavily. The next night, temperatures plummeted to minus 20 degrees centigrade. Few men or women had proper winter uh, clothing or access to shelter. Yeah, that's Americans. Oh, minus four Fahrenheit, okay. I was about to calculate it. Many froze to death overnight. The next morning, wagons and guns were abandoned. Many soldiers sought to save themselves, ignoring officers, stealing horses and food, and leaving the column to scour the countryside for supplies. I mean, this is just turning into a huge disaster for Napoleon, plus just the carnage everywhere. I just can't imagine. Oh my gosh. Man, Russia, you guys have had to put up with some pretty awful stuff on your in your territory, that's for sure. My goodness. Guys, I'm sorry for all the sniffling too. My I can't even breathe through my nose right now. My allergies are so bad. Many of these foragers were found by the Cossacks. Some cut down or lanced. Others robbed of every possession and left to freeze. In a few cases, they were handed over to peasants, eager for retribution against the foreign invaders who had plundered all they owned. Oh my gosh, just a horrible situation. As the army struggled on towards Smolensk through blizzards, Napoleon ordered Eugène's IV Corps to strike out for Vitebsk, where there were large French supply depots. But Vitebsk had already fallen to the Russians. Fourth He's just not Corps giving was up, too is he? weak to fight its way through and rejoined the army, minus its artillery and most of its baggage. A colonel who saw 4th Corps at this stage described men without shoes, almost without clothes, exhausted and famished, sitting on their packs, sleeping on their knees, and only rousing themselves out of this stupor to grill slices of horse meat or melt bits of ice. Oh my god, oh my god, I just... I just saw what that was in that picture. They're cutting a horse up. <sighs> okay, I, I, I can't. We're gonna fast forward a little bit. Okay. Army was dead or captured. About half the rest formed oh, a growing army was something. dead. Or just three weeks after leaving Moscow, a third of the army was dead or captured. About Third. half the rest formed a growing army of stragglers, men without units, prepared to fight only to survive. Yeah. Napoleon Great reached idea, Smolensk Napoleon. on the 9th of November. The first troops into town ransacked the supply depots, leaving nothing for those who followed, including Ney's rearguard, which arrived six days later. Napoleon had hoped to make Smolensk his winter base, but the state of the army and lack of supplies meant the retreat had to continue. 
but the five days he spent there gave Kutuzov time to circle ahead and prepare an ambush. When the French retreat resumed, he struck 30 miles west of Smolensk at Krasny. In three days of desperate fighting through knee-deep snow, Napoleon used his Imperial Guard to hold open the road, as Eugène and Davout's corps fought their way through the ambush with heavy losses. I mean, how are the French even still fighting at this point? I mean, it sounds like it's just been so devastating. If I was one of the soldiers in their army, like, I just, I wouldn't even want to be doing anything anymore. I just want to get the heck out of there. It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Being in the military back then was just sounded awful. Sounded absolutely awful. Again, like, not that modern wars are great either, but, I mean, a lot of this stuff doesn't happen anymore today, you know, because of technology advances and stuff, but... Oh my gosh. Two regiments of the Young Guard were ordered to make a sacrificial counterattack to keep the Russians at bay. It just gets bay. worse. It just gets worse. They were virtually annihilated. I mean... Kutuzov held back many of his troops and was blamed for not trying to destroy Napoleon's army when he had the chance. It's possible he was concerned at the number of raw conscripts in his own army, also suffering terribly in the freezing conditions. Also, what's wrong with this guy's eye? He's like the one eye general, right? His right eye looks a little uh, lazy there, so... Did he have an injury or something to his eye? Is that why it's like that? Or was he just born like that? All the Cossacks and the Russians in the world shall not permit me from rejoining the army. Russian, eh? What's happened to him? Not every French corps broke through at Krasny. Marshal Ney and his 6,000 strong rearguard arrived on the 18th of November to find the road blocked by 60,000 Russian troops and no sign of the promised support from Davout's first corps. 60,000. Ney's men hurled themselves against the Russian lines with desperate courage, How many does but he were have? mown down. Rejecting several invitations to surrender, Ney led the survivors in a daring night crossing of the Dnipro River. Then across 45 miles of open country under constant attack from Platov's Cossacks to reach Osha. By the time Ney rejoined the army, his rear guard was down to just 800 fighting men, leading a column of several thousand stragglers. Wow. The army regarded his escape as a miracle, and when Napoleon heard of it, he immediately dubbed Marshal Ney the bravest of the brave. Huh. This is beginning to be very serious. Beginning? Um, this is the understatement of this video right here. My dude, I think you should have realized this, you know, a few weeks ago, maybe. So it really does look like at this point the Russians are outnumbering the French, which is how I thought this was going to go down. So I'm actually shocked that that's actually happening. Although, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because sometimes I don't really have a good sense of the, to the total numbers on either side. But it's, it looks like to me that the Russians outnumber the French at this point. Because it seems like the French are just dropping dead everywhere. Napoleon had escaped one trap. But now three Russian armies were closing in from different directions. And outnumbered him nearly three to one. From the east, Kutuzov's main army with 65,000 men. From the north, Wittgenstein, with 30,000, steadily driving back Marshal Victor's IX Corps. And from the south, Admiral Chichagov's Army of Moldavia, with 34,000, having detached General Ostenzaken with 30,000, to prevent Schwarzenberg's Austrians and Renier's Saxon Corps marching to Napoleon's aid. Napoleon was heading for Minsk, a major French supply base with vast stores of the food, clothing, shoes and ammunition that his army so desperately needed. But on the 21st of November, disastrous news arrived. Minsk had fallen to Chichagov. He'd then marched on Borisov, driven out the Polish garrison, I mean, and captured its bridge over the Berzina River. They've got Napoleon trapped here. 
by How rights, the Berezina ought to have frozen solid by now, so Napoleon could have crossed oh. anywhere. Look at that. But a sudden thaw had turned the river into a torrent of ice and freezing water. Yeah, it's hard water. to get through that. Yeah. It's not happening. Napoleon was, at least, joined by the hard-fighting Marshal Oudinot and his second corps, which hadn't suffered as badly as the main column on its retreat from Polatsk. Oudinot launched an immediate counter-attack on Borisov and retook the town, but couldn't stop the Russians burning the bridge. With no other bridge for miles in either direction, it seemed Napoleon's exhausted army was finally doomed. <laughs> but they but get there out was somehow. one sliver of hope. Polish cavalry had found a ford across the river, near the village of Studienka. Napoleon issued a flurry of orders. Second Corps was to fake preparations for a river crossing south of Borisov. Victor's Ninth Corps, arriving from the north, was to form a rear guard east of Studienka to hold the Russians at bay, while engineers worked as quickly as possible to build pontoon bridges across the river and win Napoleon's army a fighting chance of escape. Our situation is unparalleled. If Napoleon extricates himself today, he must have the devil in him. Marshal Ney to General Rapp. So this is on the French side saying this. Our situation is unparalleled. If Napoleon extricates himself today, he must have the devil inside him. Okay, so if he's successful in retreating, he must have the devil in him. Okay. I get what he's saying. On the afternoon of the 25th of November, General Eblay's Dutch engineers began building two 300-foot pontoon bridges across the Berezina River. 300 feet, that's... They worked day and night, sometimes no chest feet. deep in freezing water, oh and completed gosh. both bridges in less than 24 hours. So Few back of then, the engineers just... survived the ordeal. Wait, what? Few of the engineers survived the ordeal. Chichagov had been totally fooled by the diversion south of Borisov and was moving his troops south to face it, allowing Napoleon's army to begin crossing its rickety bridges virtually unopposed. Udino's second corps led the way to secure a bridgehead, followed the next day by the remnants of the main army. Russia is not going to catch on what's going on was given here. to formed troops, still able to fight. For the time being, the army's vast crowd of stragglers... Look at that. That is amazing. Look at all of those people trying to... Yeah, coordinating that has to be a nightmare. ...remained on the far bank. Are they gonna get stuck over there? By the time Chichagov realized his mistake and began moving north, Napoleon had troops in place to defend the crossing. On the east bank, General Partonneur's 12th Division 4,000 relatively fresh troops from Victor's 9th Corps formed the rear guard. As Platov's Cossacks approached from the east, the vanguard of Kutuzov's main army, Partonneur tried to rejoin 9th Corps. But caught in a swirling blizzard, with visibility down to 50 meters, he marched straight into Wittgenstein's army. His entire division was killed or captured. The next morning, Chichagov and Wittgenstein launched coordinated attacks on both sides of the river. There was desperate fighting on the West Bank, where Marshal Udino was, yet again, seriously wounded, but his Swiss infantry held the line, until General Dumerck's cuirassiers the army's last heavy cavalry charged and routed the Russians. At great cost, Polish and German troops of Victor's rearguard held off the Russians until dark, then pulled back across the bridges. For two nights, officers had been trying to get the vast camp of stragglers to cross the bridges when they weren't being used. 
but with temperatures reaching minus 30 centigrade, they preferred to stay thing. put, huddled around their fires. Oh jeez, no! Not another horse being cut dawn, open! On the 29th, oh with the gosh. army leaving and the Russians approaching, thousands of stragglers surged in panic towards the bridges. Dozens were crushed underfoot. Others fell or were pushed into the water, or tried to swim, which was just certain mean. death. This is just one nightmare after another. Just, I mean, it doesn't stop. This... My gosh, this was just a huge disaster going into Russia, wasn't it? I mean, you think you would learn your lesson. After this and after Hitler and World War II, you just don't try to invade Russia. It's not going to work out very well for you. Although, I don't know, like, modern modern warfare is a little different, so I don't know. What do you guys think, if you're more familiar with military stuff, do you guys think that there could be a successful invasion of Russia these days? Or are there still, you know, things in place in Russia that would make that really, really difficult to do? I know Russia's military is very powerful. I'm sure they have huge defenses, you know, to keep people out of... <laughs> you know, from invading their country, but I'm just assuming that a lot of the scenarios that uh, Hitler ran into and that these troops ran into probably wouldn't happen these days with modern warfare. But you guys give me your, uh, there's some, something floating, but you guys give me your opinion on that. What do you think? Could somebody successfully invade Russia these days? Or would it turn out very much like this? When French engineers burned the bridges at 9 a.m., thousands were cut off and left to the mercy of the advancing Cossacks. I had a feeling that was going to happen. Was, this just looks like hell on earth. This is just hell on earth right here is basically what's going through my mind. Reminds me of all of those paintings that we saw in one of the, the last couple of music videos I've done on the story of music where we saw all of those like hellish paintings talking about Wagner's music and the Romantic era. These paintings are showing more realistic, you know, pictures of what happened, but it looks equally as hellish to me. Oh my gosh. I mean, just to imagine being stuck in this crowd right here. Oh my gosh, like I can't, I can't. I don't know, by this point I would, I would might just like just want to go ahead and die and just be done with it. Became prisoners. Others were simply put out of their misery. <sighs> what an appalling misery, <laughs> yeah. What a multitude have perished in this retreat. Since the retreat began 43 days earlier, the Grande Armée had marched nearly 500 miles under constant attack, starved, exhausted, and for the last 23 days in lethal sub-zero temperatures, without proper clothing or shelter. Okay, so is this the border of... I was wondering where the border was. Is that it? The dash line? Without proper clothing or shelter. So they're not even out of Russia yet at this point, I'm assuming. Still got a little ways to go. In that time, the fighting strength of the Grande Armée had been reduced from around 124,000 men to 20,000, with as many stragglers still following the army. As the retreat continued to Vilna, the weather turned even worse temperatures falling to minus 37 degrees centigrade. <laughs> the Russian armies at least said, now Whoa. held back, leaving the winter, Cossacks oh and Russian peasants to finish off the invaders. On the 5th of December, Napoleon oh left the army, travelling incognito across Europe at breakneck speed. Oh and reaching no, he Paris did not. In just 13 days. Did he just, like, give up on all of his troops? Well, that's a heck of a leader for you right there. I'm assuming that's what's happening here. Naturally, English satirists capitalized on Napoleon seeming to abandon his defeated army. Okay. And many soldiers did regard it as an act of betrayal. But his generals supported his decision to leave. There's already been one attempted coup against Napoleon in Paris. Okay. And there was much work to be done to rebuild the army and reassure France's allies. On the 9th of December, 51 days after the retreat began, 
around 20,000 ragged survivors of the Grande Armée began crossing the Nyman River back into friendly Polish territory. According to legend, Marshal Ney was the last man across. <laughs> Interesting to know if that's true or not. Second and Third Corps are no more than a memory. <laughs> the latter number is only 60. What a disaster. Napoleon's invasion of Russia had proved to be one of the greatest military disasters in history. He had made fatal miscalculations about geography, logistics, and above all, Russia's political and strategic response to his invasion. He made a lot of wrong assumptions about These Russia. blunders cost his empire around half a million men, as well as a quarter of a million horses and a thousand cannon. Oh my gosh. Put another way, of every 12 men who marched into Russia with the Grande Armée, one like was killed one. in action or died of wounds. Two were taken prisoner, one of whom died in captivity. Seven died from disease or oh. the effects of climate. Okay. Just two returned alive. Yeah, I was gonna say like one or two made it back and yeah, that's right. Contrary to myth, many more soldiers had died in the summer advance from heat, typhus, and dysentery. Yeah. I than had were lost somebody. In the winter retreat. <laughs> That's really amazing considering what we just watched. But I did have somebody in the comments on one of my last videos of Napoleon, maybe the, one of the last two of them. They uh, mentioned that that there were more that died in the summer than there were in the winter. Which is nuts, because what we just watched through the winter is hellish. And to think that the summer was even worse than that, I can't, I can't imagine. Like, it's just, just been a horrible few months for Napoleon's army. Russian military casualties were estimated at 150,000. And a huge oh, really but unknown number of civilian deaths. The Russian campaign was a catastrophe for Napoleon. Not just in lost troops and resources, but in damage to prestige and reputation. That winter, all his enemies sensed weakness and prepared to join forces against him. But the Emperor wasn't going down without a fight. Back in Paris, he admitted to his ministers, Fortune has dazzled me, gentlemen. I've let it lead me astray. Instead of following my plan, I went to Moscow. I thought I'd make peace there. I stayed too long. I've made a grave mistake, but I'll have the means to repair it. So what was his plan then? Uh, he implies here that his plan was not to go to Moscow. That was just kind of like a decision he made on the fly, I guess. So what was his plan? Was his plan to um, leave Russia, you know, as an ally? Which sounds like he should have done that. <laughs> That's probably what he should have done. All right, so that was the end of the video. Um, at least Napoleon admitted to his mistakes at the end there. I can see why he maybe went back to France and left his soldiers behind. There was really no point in him staying there anyway, and he had more like political and diplomatic affairs to attend to back in France. So I can kind of understand that, but I can also understand the soldier's point of view, what it must have looked like for him to just abandon them like that. I guess it just depends on how you look at it, what what you're coming from. Yeah, this was the hardest video of, of this entire series for me to watch so far. I mean, like I said, it was just one nightmare after another, one disaster after another. So many people died. Of course, them cutting into the horses didn't help a whole lot. Yeah, I'm glad that you guys let me know in the comments on my last video that uh, like Sharp and Waterloo are not super graphic because of the time that they were made and they were made for TVs. I don't know. I, th this is something where I guess it's nice to know the truth about what happened, but at the same time, I don't know. That stuff is really hard for me to watch. So as long as they aren't like slicing into horses and stuff like that, uh, or I don't see like people being beheaded. That's the other thing that, that really, um, you know. So yeah, I actually don't know what happens at this point. 
it looks like a lot of nations are going to start to come together maybe in, in another coalition against Napoleon and uh, kind of maybe finally take him out. But that is interesting. As soon as you show some weakness, it emboldens your enemies to kind of like come together and go against you even more so. So yeah, Russia looks like a very, very hard country to invade and take control of. Um, so was there ever a time in history where Russia was successfully invaded? I'd like to know about that. Who did it? When, when it was? And you know, how they accomplished it. But from what I've seen so far with this and also in World War II when Hitler tried to do it, it seems to be kind of an impossible task. So I don't know what's next. I think we're probably going to go into 1813 here. Um, it looks like the fighting is going to shift more towards you know, Europe, continental Europe at this point. But if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe. We're going to have the rest of this series coming up pretty soon here. So make sure you stay tuned for that and we will see you next time. Thank you.